Just to talk about the hatch window, and um, I think like most people who's in the industry for any time, we start to collect a lot of, of things along the way, and we kind of like to um, find things that are relevant. And I quite like this postcard. So this is actually from the sort of, I think it's from the late 40s, early 50s, from uh, a series of postcards. And when you talk about the hatch window, this is kind of what I'm thinking about, this race. But of course, in nature, the race is actually a, a team race. We don't want the first one across the line. You know, with the, a clutch of eggs, they have to hatch together. So it's very important in nature that they hatch together so that the, the mother hen can take them to find water and to find food. So with that, we'll go on to what we're going to actually talk about. So first of all, we're going to obviously, what is the hatch window? Uh, why it matters, why it is so important. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the 59 steps. Uh, don't worry too much. It, it will become apparent what I'm going to be talking about. Then I'm going to talk about the, let them sleep deeply and then wake them slowly because that's when we talk about um, putting our eggs into stasis to, to slow that development down, the, the cooler we can keep them, the, the longer we can keep them. But that comes at a risk that when we, we start to wake them up, we don't want to do it too quick or we're going to get the condensation. Then we're going to talk about speed control because um, that's what hatch window is essentially about. It's, it's that if we allow them to develop too quick, they're going to hatch too soon. And that balance of making sure that they're all within a certain time frame. Then we're going to talk about mechanical mindfulness. So that's not just engineering, that, that's what's going on in your machines. So we, there's a lot of things we need to think about how we set our machines up to make sure we're not actually um, giving ourselves problems later on. And then I'm going to talk about hatch induction. So that's... Uh, Something I want to talk about because I then want to talk about observer effect. And a lot of times when we do a hatch window investigation, we change the hatch window because literally we're going in and having a look. So let's start. Um, so what is the hatch window? Well, very simply, it's just that first chick to hatch all the way through to the last one. So it's very simple. How long does it take from the first bird out to the last bird. Now, if we think, you know, why is, if we look at that first bird that's hatched out, why can this become a problem for us? Is because as soon as they start um, externally breathing, so using lung function to breathe, then those birds are going to start losing moisture at a rate that's higher than when they're still using the Coriolans hose. So it's something we need to, to think about. We don't want to make it too long. We don't want those birds to suffer. So a, a good hatch window would have this typical kind of bell curve to it. Uh, a hatch window that's too long, you're going to see it's much flatter, take longer for them to come out. That's going to be a problem because the first ones to hatch, they're going to end up getting dehydrated. You might see some extra development on them. This is when you'll start seeing meconium on the, the eggs as well. Now, we always talk about a, a good short hatch window. Now I've been to hatcheries where we've had very short window hatch windows, but that's because they haven't allowed all the chicks to come out. So it's very important when we're looking at the hatch window, we're taking everything into account. It's not from the first chick to start hatching to when you pull. You have to wait for all the birds to come out. Now, like I say, that's, that's a good hatch window, that one in blue there, but this is the sort of ideal hatch window. Now, in terms of how long it takes, it's still the same. But if you look, that bell curve's been pushed back. So the first one's still hatched on the same time, but there's been a delay in the initial start of hatch, and the majority of them push back and then they'll come on later on. And I'll come back to that later because it's something that happens in nature 
and some things uh, that that we used to do in the hatchery in the old days just by closing up the machine. But we'll, we'll come back to that more in depth later on. So let's get on to the 59 steps. Um, and that 59 steps is, is the stages it takes from a single cell to a, 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 a day old chick. So we, we're getting that initial, um, from where it takes from fertilization. And for that, we're gonna go inside the, the hen. And then you're gonna get that over being released into the overduct. You will see it will be fertilized at this point. So from here, you start getting uh, cellular replication, that cell division. It's gonna continue all the way down until it gets into the shell gland. Majority of the time that, that egg that is now forming that little embryonic germ is gonna spend most of its time in that shell gland, getting the mammillary comb put on, getting that cuticle placed on. And then even after it's been hatched, those cells are still developing. So yeah, I, I say 40 to 60,000, some people say 80,000, some different um, papers will give you lots of different numbers. It really doesn't matter. What's important is there's a big variation between what you can get, because this is where already our hatch window starts to drift uh, apart. So these are the, <clears throat> the stages from when we take our egg, so when we've got our egg in our cold store, but you'll see they can be anything from a nine and a half, even up to a 13. And that's gonna really depend on, on a number of factors. So the temperature of the, the mother hen, the kind of nest boxes it's going, and we'll, we'll come on to that in a moment. Transportation issues, how you're gonna store them in the, the egg store, make sure we don't get any further development. But this journey, this, this uh, 59 steps, then carries on when we start to incubate those embryos. And you'll see it's going all the way through and all these different stages. It's, for me, it's, um, I kind of liken it to this, this journey, this train journey. And each of those stages is a, a station along the way. Now, they're not all exactly the same distance apart, if you know what I mean, because these stages are determined by a person who's looking for physical differences. But the important thing is we can speed this up. So if we add heat, if we increase the, the amount of heat, we're going to speed that process up and we can slow it down. So too cold is going to slow it down too much. And that's quite important. So even when we get our egg into the, the cold store, they may be at different stages already. Okay. One of the things that will cause those different stages was the, the size of the egg itself. So here you have two eggs. You've got the small one on the left-hand side, the large one on the right-hand side. And you will see that after lay, they're going to start to cool down. Now, it's only when that embryonic germ go, goes below physiological zero. Now, the smaller egg, because it has a greater surface area to mass, that's going to cool down before the larger egg. So that development's going to stop before the larger egg. So you need to consider that as well. So if you've got, as an example, poor um, uniformity, you're already at a disadvantage because some germs are going to be developing further than others. I spoke about the kind of nest boxes you use. So you have here uh, manual nest boxes. So when the first hen goes in and lays an egg, that egg is still going to sit there until the next collection. So it may have uh, another three hens, four hens going in, sitting on top of that egg. So the first one that's been laid is going to be further developed than the last one that's been laid. And you're not going to see that if we look at automatic nest boxes, because those eggs are going to roll away and start to cool already. So they're going to be more uniform in terms of the stage of development than manual nest boxes. Other things we might want to check, 
or be at least be aware of the kind of egg flats that you use. So if you're collecting on plastic trays, for example, in your, uh, on your farm, they're going to cool much better than a carton tray. So because you can get a lot of airflow through those plastic trays on the, the farm uh, trolleys, they're going to cool much more uniformly. Whereas if you've got carton trays, what you'll find is if you pack them too soon, they're not going to be able to cool down. So you'll see that temperature variance between the eggs. That means if it's above physiological zero, you'll still get development. All these things are going to influence how long it takes that egg when it starts to incubate until it hatches. So we need to be aware of all these things. Another thing which is really kind of interesting is Newton's law of, of cooling. And this is in still air. So bearing in mind, if you put eggs into an environment, so if we take eggs, put them into the cold store, this is how they cool down. So you'll see it, it's quite uh, dramatic at first. But the closer they get to the, the um, target temperature, the slower or the, the more it slows down. So still air is not really your friend if you want to cool something down or in fact heat it up and we'll come back to that in a moment. So one of the things you want to bring those, uh, the temperature of those eggs down. So below physiological zero and we will talk about um, temperatures and how long you're going to store your eggs in a moment. But we don't want to take those eggs up unless you're doing a spidey's treatment. We don't want to take those temperature of those eggs up until we're ready to incubate. What we see a lot of is they'll, they'll come down and they go back up during transportation. And the problem with that is, especially here, because I'm in uh, Malaysia and in Asia, we get a lot of trucks that aren't properly insulated. So if it's hot outside and the temperature of uh, of the sun beating against the side of the truck, you'll get heating, but it'll come from the outside in. So what you'll find is that the eggs in the middle of the mass, they'll still remain cold or cool. Whereas the other ones will, might even start getting development from the side, especially if you've got roller shutter doors and they're not well insulated. So something to be thinking about. Uh, in terms of what temperatures we're going to keep those eggs when they come into the cold store. We want to, the longer we're going to store them, the colder we have to go. Now you'll see these kind of, of charts, you know, if we're going to hold them for 12 days, we're going to put that temperature down. What that doesn't mean is we don't want to bring the temperature down that the, the older they get. And I've seen this several times in hatcheries. And what we're really doing here is missing the boat because what we have to do is bring that temperature down immediately. So if we know we're going to hold those eggs for a long period of time, from the very uh, moment you get to the hatchery, we bring that temperature down. Now, that means you can then start, when you're going to start incubating, you can take your time to bring that temperature up. It's very important we bring it up to avoid condensation. Something else that happens during um, long storage. And now this is a stage 11 that you see on the left-hand side here. And the longer we store these eggs for, you will start seeing more cellular mortality. So those little dead cells that you see there. What that means in terms of where our endpoint is, where our hatch date is, that finish line, that means the longer you store the eggs, the further it moves from the, the finish line. So the longer you're gonna to have to incubate for. So without spiders, you're gonna to need to start adding incubation time, when we, especially when we get past seven days. If you do a spiders treatment, you can reduce the amount you need to add, but that's really dependent on the temperature of your eggs, uh, how long you're storing for, and the temperature you're, you're doing your spiders treatment at. And like cooling the eggs down when you're ready to take those eggs back up again, they're going to warm up in the same, that same um, 
uh, format or that 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 same bell curve here. Not really a bell curve. Uh, so what I always advise people to do is use a large capacity fan, but on a low setting, and you can move air across those trolleys, and they'll bring that temperature down um, much better than if you just leave them in still air. Now, ideally, it's always better if you're going to pre-incubate or, or uh, preheat to do it inside an incubator. So put the eggs inside, have the, 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 the fans running, so we're moving air around it. Otherwise, it will take a long time for those eggs, and they'll, like I say, they're warm from the outside in, and then you're going to see that hatch window drifting apart. Something else you really need to be aware of. So this would be the, the surface of the eggshell. You'll always see there's some bacteria on there. You know, typically on a clean nest egg, 300 to 500 bacteria. Now, when you take those eggs from a cold room, like the egg store, and you put them into a warmer room with humidity, that humidity that's in the environment is going to touch the, the surface of the eggshell. And that's what you, uh, when you get the condensation. Okay, I, I cannot stress, this is not sweating. This is not coming from the inside of the egg. It's coming from the moisture that's in the air. There's two problems with this. One, whenever you get it, you're also going to get um, cooling. So you'll get some uh, cooling going across that. So if you want to know what that feels like, if you lick the back of your hand and blow on it, it feels very cold. Now, bear it in mind, you're trying to warm these eggs up at the same time. So you don't want evaporative cooling on eggs that you're trying to warm up. The other point of that is also because now you've got moisture into the mix with bacteria, the bacteria will start going down into the egg. So you know, really do all you can to avoid condensation on your eggs. Yeah, uh, this is, I just put this in there so you have it, but really it's, just to push the point that condensation is not sweating. You know, when you, you go and grab a can of Coke out of the fridge, you'll see that same condensation on the side of the, the can, but it's not coming from inside. It's, it's taking the air that's outside and that moisture from there. Now, this is just a, a chart. Actually, I, I built this quite recently. But I wanted to explain when you take eggs out, because it really depends the, the environment that you take the egg from or the temperature you take the egg from. And then when you put it into another environment. So here I've got eggs at 14 degrees. So if I want to start um, preheating these eggs, I would don't want to take it up to where it's going to get condensation. So I can take it up to 23 degrees with 55% relative humidity and not get condensation. Uh, once it's there, or just because you, uh, as this starts to increase, you can actually already start pushing the temperature up. But you'll see here, you've got to take it in stages. You can't just put them directly in the incubator, or you will get condensation and you'll get an increase in bangers. Your uh, initial start of that incubation will take a little bit longer as well. Now, in terms of incubation temperature, and whenever I talk about incubation temperature, I'm talking about eggshell temperature. I'm not talking about the air temperature inside your machine, because that really depends on where your probe is and, and how much air velocity you have and heat production from your eggs. But I'm talking about just the eggshell temperature. And typically, you'll take it with something like the Thermoscan 6500 and you'll take it across the equator there. So 100 degrees is the ideal. Anything less is going to be slow development. Anything uh, above that during the endothermic stage is going to be accelerated growth. But once we get to about day 12 to 15, depending on the size of the egg, you're going to see retarded development as well. So that growth is going to be uh, you end up with a smaller chick, and I'll explain why that is in a moment. When we go above that 103, you're going to start seeing embryonic mortality. And what this means, so if we're incubating uh, at different temperatures in this example, now we've got our chronological age. So all these eggs have been in the incubator 
for 504 hours. So they've been incubated for 504 hours. So exactly 21 days. But what you'll find is the biological age is all different. And this is really what we're talking about when we discuss hatch window is trying to keep that biological age all the same. I looked at, um, just grabbed a, a random example from the, the James Way incubators, a large machine. And I wanted to look at how much heat is being produced inside that machine. Now, when I look at, at heat production, I'm looking at the age of the flock and I'm looking at fertility. But when I talk about age of the flock, what I'm really talking about is the size of the egg. It, it, I don't really care how, how old it is. I want to know how big the egg is. So that's going to tell me how big is that uh, embryo going to be. And the bigger the embryo, the more heat production you're going to get from it. And of course, if we, we need to know what the fertility is, because if it's low fertility, then you can have a very high heat producing egg. But if you don't have many of them, then it's not a lot of heat anyway. But if we have a very high fertility, um, that's going to make a big difference. And I did this, uh, this chart. So I won't worry too much about the numbers because this is more relevant if you're, if you're looking at exactly the same breed. Um, so you could calculate how much heat production one flock would have against the other, so long as it's, it's of the same breed. But what I really wanted to show here is, and it came from a client who was just setting eggs um, based on the age of the flock. So that which position he would put it in the machine was just purely based on age. And I just wanted to show that, you know, a, a flock, um, depending on that fertility, can have a, a very low heat production or can have a very high heat production. So we need to be looking at both of those things. And if we we look at heat production and the most obvious uh, difference it, we can look at is broilers and layers. So obviously a, a broiler is going to produce a lot more heat than a layer. And that's really determined by how masculine the, the male and the female are or how feminine they are. So, and that's, you know, if, if you look at just, uh, a layer is going to be far more feminine, of course, because she needs to lay a lot of eggs. Whereas a broiler is going to be more masculine because we want him to, to, to grow and develop very quickly. Uh, now I realize I've just walked into a political minefield, so I'm going to back out of that one right now. Um, but those are the things that's important. How much, uh, how much, uh, how masculine or female the, the parents are, because that's going to make a difference on the size of the egg. And that, that's where we're going to see that, that difference. So yeah, I'm going to come back to the genetics question in a little while. So if we look at actual heat production from an egg, uh, we want our eggshell to remain 100 degrees all the way through. Now, at the beginning, it's not going to produce any heat until it gets to around day seven, then it's a little bit, but it will get progressively higher. The air temperature is at the beginning is going to be the same as the egg, but the more heat that that egg produces, the lower we need to bring that air temperature. So if we have large eggs, high fertility flocks, that's going to be more heat production. So the air temperature is going to have to be lower to maintain that 100 degrees eggshell temperature. And if we have uh, lower fertility flocks or smaller eggs, then that heat production is going to be less. So our air temperature is going to have to be higher to compensate for that. doesn't matter where it is, so long as that eggshell temperature remains at 100. Of course, if you've got poor fertility, uh, this really is not going to help you at all. So this is when you have this kind of fertility, your hatch window is going to really struggle because they take different amounts of time to, to warm up. Uh, they produce different amounts of heat. Uh, this next one, this is actually an example that uh, a client of ours, he said he had fairies in the hatcher, which uh, was quite interesting. But uh, I just assumed he was drunk, to be honest. But when I went out there and I looked and um, and that's what I found. So let me explain what's going on here. When you've got 
small eggs put in amongst the majority are, are large eggs. Those small eggs are going to get up to incubation temperature first because there's less mass. Now, normally that wouldn't matter because if they're all with small eggs, you don't get a lot of heat production from them. But because they're next to, to larger eggs, which are transferring the heat from themselves onto the small one, you've now got a small egg with a, a small embryo inside getting forced out first. So losing condition from, from the, the very start. This is what we ended up with. This is what he was calling fairies, these tiny little chicks, the non-starters that we get. You'd cull them out. Now, if you're in a situation where you have this, this is really going to affect your hatch window, but this is also, these eggs need to be taken away uh, and set individually. So if you've got those tiny eggs, keep them to one side, set them on their own trays uh, away from the others. Uh, just, I'm just going to cover this here, a bunch of different multi-stage. When I talk about what I'm going to be talking about next, it's not really relevant to multi-stage because multi-stage is an average of an average. So we're never going to be really optimizing multi-stage because there's always going to be so many variables. So I'm, I'm not really going to cover those. This is more geared towards single stage. So we're talking about incubating eggs from, from day zero and then through the hatch. Now, at the very beginning of incubation, we have to bear in mind the Van't Hoff rule. So if you haven't heard of this, very simple rule. So uh, Jacobus was a, a chemist from, from Holland, and he just discovered that the more you warm something up, the faster the reaction. So it, it, that's as simple as it can be, really. But this is really relevant for incubation for the first four days. It's still afterwards, but it becomes less so. And the reason for that is that that embryonic germ is biochemical in nature for the first four days. Once it goes past that first four days, then it, it gets less uh, right up until when we get to day 12, 15, and then it completely reverses. And now, uh, talking about sealed incubation. So this is where you, you're going to, for the first seven to nine days, you're going to close that machine up. So we don't want to go into it. We want to completely seal it up. And the, the best way I can explain why this helps so much and why it keeps such a uniform temperature inside the machine is by, by showing the, uh, the benefits of a log cabin because a log cabin is probably one of the best insulated homes in the world. If you think about the log cabin, they're, they're always uh, in the middle of a snowstorm there. But what you'll find with those, they don't need a lot of heating because there's nowhere for the heat to go. So, so long as that, that remains sealed, and it's the same with your incubator, so long as the incubator is sealed, the temperature inside is going to be incredibly stable. Now, the only time that changes is if you crack a window or open a door or have a leak inside your incubator. So if your incubator is leaking, that means air is going to come out. But as if air is going out, it's also coming in and it's going to be a different temperature. So you'll see you're going to get variation inside the machine. That variation inside the machine is going to affect development rates of the eggs that are in there. Now, I spoke about uh, retardation of, of the embryo during late incubation. So from day 17, it's going to start retracting that yolk into itself. Now, that um, because the one on the right-hand side is being incubated at too high a temperature, it can't utilize the yolk properly. So what you will find is you'll end up with a, a smaller bird with a larger yolk, and that's often why you see those black navels, because it can't heal itself up, you can't heal that navel across. So it's really uh, important, not just for hatch window, but also for chick quality, because if those navels are unhealed, then you're really, those, those birds are going to be very susceptible to any kind of bacteria. But we don't want to do that, so it's, it's important we check it. The other thing with hatch window, especially I know you guys in the US are uh, in over-vaccinating everything, 
And that's that uh, biological age is really important if you're doing a novo vaccination. So if that embryo is not far enough along developed, then the chances are you're going to inject into the allantoic. And if you do that, that's just into the waste fluid. So the, the bird's not going to take it up. So if you get it into the allantois, your, develop, your uh, protective index isn't going to be good enough. So uh, it's, it's something that becomes really important, especially if you are doing an over-vaccination, to make sure those, those um, embry uh, embryos are all of a similar biological age. Here you can just see uh, the here. You can see the protection is is less. So especially with an over vaccination, it's much better to do it later than than earlier. Yeah, this is the the question that always comes up, and we always get um, uh, sort of thrown at us that it's genetics that is causing the increasing in heat inside the incubators. Oh, before I go on to that, let me just thank uh, uh, Professor Gianna Wilson for these photos, because I think they're absolutely fantastic. But they are showing um, broilers from the old breeds, so from 57, and this is up to 2012. Same amount of feed, same amount of time, but how one can convert to another, uh, convert that feed into meat. And because people see this, they say, okay, well then, because it can do that, then the heat production is much higher inside the incubators. It's uh, not really, it's not really true. What, what does happen is because the broiler can convert that meat into, sorry, that feed into meat that quickly, its parents also get quicker, uh, bigger, quicker. And if its parent get bigger, the egg size gets bigger. So you have bigger eggs, uh, but also you have higher fertility. So if we look at um, <clears throat> what the main cause of heat production from our eggs, it, it's the size of the egg and the, the fertility of that, um, that clutch of egg. <clears throat> so if we look at it in terms of mass, we don't have higher temperature for the same amount of mass. What we have is we have more mass, which is obviously going to give you higher temperature, but also we have more life. And that's why we have more heat production inside our incubators. It's not just as simple as saying, oh, the genetics have changed, therefore we have more heat being produced. Uh, something else I wanted to mention, and this comes from a lot of, because people want uh, higher density machines, so they'll buy the biggest machine when they put the hatchery in, and then they'll part load the machine. Now, when, when an incubator is built, it's built for a certain amount of mass. And if you don't put that mass in the incubator, you've got too much heat going in. So the eggs are going to get too hot. The cooling is going to come on. There's too much cooling now because there's less mass than the heating. And you'll get this up and down of heating, cooling, heating, cooling, in the first four days of incubation, that's a complete disaster. So you'll see a lot more uh, malformations from that. Um, but it's it's just, you know, your hatch window will just go, go uh, completely bizarre. So what I would say is when you're going to um, buy machines, buy machines for the flock sizes you have. Don't buy the biggest machine because per egg space is cheaper. Because in, in actually, if you look, if we need is quality from those eggs. We need quality chicks coming out. Yeah, this is uh, just another one I wanted to mention on partially loading machines. So if you look uh, here, yeah, here you go. So now all majority of machines, they'll have a circular airflow. So it will go around in a, a particular way. And that's fine so long as that machine is loaded properly. What you will find if somebody doesn't, and I see this quite a lot, where they leave a, an empty trolley, the air will shortcut back around to the, and the, so that, that cycle will become smaller. And now you're not getting any cooling going on in the far corner. 
So if you if you're going to part load a machine, talk with the 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 company that supplied the machine on how best to load that machine for it. Otherwise, you can see this one with your hatch window would go really wide. Uh, if we look at yeah, if we look at um, motors, fan belts, obviously they need to be spinning at the right rate. Anything like so this one here you see is just um, taken a hit. Corridor machines are quite difficult because you actually literally have to walk down the, the corridor to see which ones stop working because the, the rest of the fans will keep that fan moving around. So, but those will create overheating if you've got eggs at a later stage in there. Any motor that, that stops or even if it's not stopped, but it's not drawing enough power, that will also see your C-stop variations in your, your machines. Yeah, loose belts, if a, a belt is skipping across the motor, well, the, the fan will still be turning, but it will be turning much slower. So not uh, to the eye, it will still look like it's turning okay, but it's not going to be pushing the same amount of air around that machine. Yeah, this is really just uh, showing it, it depends. If you, you think about what you see on your machine, your incubator, and it really depends on where the, the fans are located, the, the velocity of the air around the turning. Obviously, when the eggs are turned, that's going to affect the temperature of those eggs. So we need to consider all those things. Where those sensors are, and, you know, with different machines will have sensors in different locations. Uh, the cooling, the type of cooling you use, the kind of heating. So what I'm, I'm trying to say here is just really there's so many variables. And, of course, on top of that, we have different heat productions. So this makes it really difficult uh, if you're trying to uh, run that machine just on a set program. So you do have to go in and, and measure those eggshell temperatures, make sure they're, they're as close to 100 as you can get them. Uh, when you get to hatches, it becomes even more difficult because the airflow gets messed up. But one thing I would say, uh, wherever you've got a probe, make sure you've got some kind of embryonic heat. Uh, these, where you see these machines here where they don't have anything by them, that's going to be a lot colder than where those eggs would be. And this is a, a hatcher on the right-hand side. So when those birds hatch, that temperature is going to be far too high down there for those birds because it's reading the temperature from right up here. So wherever you've got probes, make sure that you, you have embryonic heat. Uh, this is something I've done a while ago, and this is just talking about, uh, and especially the big, the new big hatcheries, when people put in a new hatchery and they want to use it straight away. But the problem here is that you normally have one run of water coming in to cool a line. And let's say you've got 100% of your air coming in, your, all your capacity for the air that comes in. Now, that air is also used for cooling the machine, of course. So we need to make sure it can be supplied to the, the machines. And then it will be split up. And in this case, in this uh, model, it's 90, 90 um, single-stage incubators across three rooms. So here you can say that we need to split that air three ways. So every, every room should get a third of the air. Now because people want to start using the incubator straight away, they'll start loading them up in this snaking fashion. And this is really the worst thing you can do. When you load it up in this way, when that heat production starts in those machines, you're going to have a single room asking for the majority of your cooling. But the majority of that, that air cooling or the air coming into that room is going to have to go through a much smaller ductwork than it's it's um, designed for. So we don't we want to avoid this, and I wanted to show just how much 
this has an inf influence. So actually last week I built a, a mathematical model to explain it. And I used a uh, damper settings that you see on the left hand side, nothing particularly special. But when I plug the numbers in, so for set a room one, set a room two, set a room three, and I just started doing them in, in um, 97. So it's batches of five. So five uh, incubators will be loaded at a time, basically. And when you see this pattern here, from this, you can actually then see how much air from um, the available air you're using in each room. And this is the problem. When you load, this is the first room. So we loaded up. I vented a little bit at the beginning. I want to get rid of that CO2 burst. And then by the time you get to the end of your second week, this is how much air those machines are asking from, from your available air. Now that means that they're not going to get 62% of the air down that ductwork for a single room. So that's, that's why I, I really wanted to explain that's going to be a problem because your machine's going to start overheating because it's not getting the air into it. It's going to be a problem because they don't get the oxygen, but also because of the heating. Now you want to stagger that loading pattern and I also put these numbers into it and it gave me a very different pattern. Looks like a, a Christmas jumper. But when you compare the numbers, this is what becomes really interesting is how much uh, air is used per room on the, the bad loading, shall we say, and how much air is used per room if you load it correctly. So you see none of these are coming anywhere close to, to stress point. So you can always get the air into that room. So something to consider if you've got a new hatchery or if you're using a hatchery and you're setting in that snaking pattern, if you can start changing that, uh, the way of doing things. Other things, uh, if we look at the, the cooling water temperature, by the time it reaches the, the setter, we want it to be uh, the correct temperature. Now, if the, the line is not insulated, that means the temperature is going to be higher by the time it reaches the incubator. So make sure you have your insulation. Other things you might see here is um, if the water pressure isn't high enough. So if that water pressure is too low, it's going to take longer to get to the, the incubator. And that means that temperature is going to be rising again. So again, speak with your supplier. What should the water pressure be? Um, make sure you, you're, you're supplying it correctly. But this is another problem with water supply. Uh, you'll see here. So these, this is actually water coming directly from the setters. And you'll see uh, this. You can see or you can imagine that the water in those pipes that are running through the cooling coils and these setters it's not going to be very efficient. You've got a lot of, of muck there going to be spoiling it up. Also, if you have uh, too much uh, calcium in there, you've got a, a lot of that buildup going on. Now, that's caused because it's too alkaline. Uh, the, the video was just because we were taking it from a, a bore, a well. So there has to be filtered before you can use it. If you have this, this buildup of lime scale, that's basically because the water's too alkaline, so you need to get it more neutral. These problems also give you uh, issues with your solenoid. So you know how a solenoid works when the, we need cooling, for example. It will be powered up. It will lift, allow the water through. You'll get your cooling. Now, sometimes you might get a bit of dirt in there that stops it from closing again. This partial blockage will mean that the incubator will continue to cool at a lower uh, amount. Majority of the time, it actually gets completely blocked. Now, that means that when your, your solenoid does come back on, it will open up. But because there's a blockage there, you're not getting any cooling. So your machine will start to go into overheating. And that's, again, it's, it's messing with your, your hatch timing. 
something that's that's actually really quite useful to do is work out what your oh i'm sorry i think we skipped one here yeah something that's really worth doing is working out what your delta t is now again you need to go to your supplier ask him what it should be um, but that delta t is how the temperature of your water going in for the cooling and the temperature of the water coming out because what it should be similar across all your machines but what you'll typically find is, especially the, the machines on the first of the run, they'll get more soiled than others. So it's really worth looking at because that delta T is how you get your cooling. And if it's not right, that means your, your, your cooling is going to be compromised. So the temperature is going to be compromised. So your hatch uh, window is going to be compromised. Yeah, of course, we use air cooling as well. This is actually, uh, uh, it's a, it was a very nice hatchery, but it just, uh, we had a problem here with this machine in the corner where you see the, the sort of pixelated guy standing there. And it was just the, the air supply going to that uh, was not as cool as elsewhere. So if you look at the machine on the, the left-hand side, you'll see this almost ghost image coming in. And you'll see that, you know, up here, you, you don't see anything. So that means you're getting more cooling air going to one machine than another. So in this case, it's just easier. But you see this overpressure grill, we could just switch this around here. So not a big deal, but something you need to be aware of. Make sure that all the machines are getting the same temperature air as well, if you're going to run on the same profile, because you could have tweaked the profile to allow it to vent more. Uh, other problems with your cooling coils. So uh, you see here, see that drip there. Now, problem with that is if you're seeing a drip like that, when you close the machine up and it's trying to, to cool, you might get a little jet coming out of there as well. You're going to get a, certainly an increase in um, water coming out, which is going to give you an issue in terms of overcooling the machine. But also a problem with the, the chick quality as well. If you see that green on the pipe, that's because your water's too acidic. So again, you need to treat that water. Uh, some of, yeah, this is just really talking about the air pressures. So we want uh, a nice circulation inside the machine. You see again, it's this, it's this cycle going around. We have positive pressure in the front of the machine. We'll have a neutral pressure at the back. And that means that when you do ventilate that machine, the air can go in, but still circulate around the machine. And that, that's how it should work. The problem is if you get too much pressure at the, the front of the machine or a negative pressure in the back, what you're going to see is that too much air is going into the machine and then it will tunnel directly from the inlet to the outlet. And that affects the air inside the machine. So you don't get the cooling around the, the corners. So it, you're not getting a nice mix of air anymore. Sometimes you'll also see some dizzy birds coming out of there. So it's something you, you need to be aware of. Don't, I've seen it a lot where people think, oh, we'll push the pressure up in front of the machine, push more air into the machine. It goes directly in and directly out. You, you don't get that nice circulation. The other thing that you might see, because we're looking at the hatches here as well, is if that vent starts to get blocked, now what you're going to get is overpressure in the back. So it's going to be the same as what's going on in the front. First thing you'll see, humidity rise, uh, temperature will rise, CO2 will rise, birds will become dizzy. So that's also going to affect, you know, all those things are going to affect how they're going to hatch. Now, now we're going to look at the, the hatching process itself. So what, and I want to, to explain this before I go on to the observer effect, because we want to make sure we don't change anything that affects this hatching process. So let's look inside. So first of all, you'll see those eggs are moving. Now, when you put eggs together, they do um, communicate in a way. They'll, they'll start shifting 
uh, in line with each other. But now you see it's internally pipped. So it's gone into that air cell. The lungs at this point are still full of fluid. So the lungs will have to dry out. Once those lungs have dried out, the bird will start to vocalize. Okay, <laughs> it needs to breathe before it can vocalize. That is a signal for the mother hen to come back. Now she will come back and sit on that clutch, push the temperature up and deplete the oxygen. So you'll see that CO2 rise, oxygen will be depleted. This is a typical um, hatching process. So that's how she induces the hatch to make sure the clutch comes in together. And so we need to consider this if we're going to start looking at hatch window. Now, the observer effect is that effect you have of when you go and look at something, do you change the, the results because you're there looking at it? And I've done a lot of, of hatch window investigations in the past, and I always found that the hatch window was quite wide. The reason the hatch window was quite wide is because I kept going into the machine and dropping the temperature and increasing the oxygen exact opposite of what induces the hatch. I was making the hatch wider just by going and have a look. So if you're going to, uh, if you want to monitor hatch window, make sure you, you, you're not going to be doing that. This was a, a quite, I thought it was quite a neat idea when I first looked at it. And this is to reduce the amount of time it takes to look at the hatch window until I put it under thermal imaging camera. Now you see that this is much colder than the rest of the environment. Because this is colder, you could fairly uh, easily assume that's going to delay the hatch of these. So this is exactly uh, observer effect uh, in process that the fact that you're going to look at it has changed the results you're going to get. So with that, you could probably just go and put it in a machine for a while and warm it up artificially before you use it but you're still going to see some uh, some observer effect anyway because you're going to go in and open those machines now typically you know uh, with good uh, management and it is good farm management hatchery management you're going to get a hatch window of around 24 to 26 hours now if we look at that first bird that comes out as soon as it breaks out, you're going to start seeing that humidity rise. Because when they come out, you, you know they're, they're wet, so they need to dry out. That humidity goes into the environment. And you can say that when you see this right here, it starts to drop down, that all the birds are out. This is probably the not only the easiest, but the most uh, reliable, because you're not affecting anything in the machine. So if you're going to look at that, that's where you would say your hatch window is. Okay. This is, and I apologize to the interpreter because she didn't know this was in here, but I wanted to explain it because I wanted to um, talk a little bit about the hatch sense as well uh, in terms of hatch window. Now, I now something. Something's not working. This is typical. Gee. One second. I just, I know what this is. I have to stop sharing and share again. I think we should be fine. Yeah, okay. So when you see these first birds coming off, what you're going to do is increase the amount of, of oxygen. So this is the ideal sort of hatch window. So you're going to increase the amount of oxygen to reduce the amount of hatch coming out. Now you're going to do that for about 12 hours. This is what typically you'd do in the, in the old days. You'd make sure that those birds uh, are 
kept a little bit cooler. So you're not inducing that hatch. Uh, plenty of oxygen in there, so there's no need for it. But when you want them to show so your, your weight, normally about 12 hours, you're going to then push that temperature up and close the machine. So you'd normally do that for about two hours, hour and a half, two hours. Um, in the old days, we just used to seal the machine, but that was enough because you're not, then not getting any air cooling. Temperature goes up, it induces the hatch. You can then bring the temperature down a little bit, allow them plenty of oxygen. Now, as soon as you see that humidity peak coming down, then just cool them right down. Cool them down, plenty of oxygen. Um, and that's why I say that that, that kind of um, hatch window, that bell curve where you've pushed it right back, you've kept the majority to the back of that hatch. And that's what you'll find your hatch sense is doing. Oh, yeah, also worth mentioning, um, because you've got a, a chick that's hatched, doesn't mean it's a disaster. Now, so long as they're just breathing through the nostrils, they're only going to lose two grams of moisture in 24-hour period. Problem only occurs if they start breathing through the mouth. So it's really essential that we keep those birds comfortable. The ones that have hatched, that they're kept comfortable. And I think we should be on to the conclusion, yeah. So the hatch window starts in the farm. So from the very beginning, that's where hatch window is. It's not just about hot and cold spots in the incubators, although of course that has a big impact, but it starts from the very beginning of, of the process. It can be affected throughout that whole operation, those whole 59 steps. Um, anything there we can, we can speed it up or we can slow it down so we want to be really careful that we keep it at the right pace and the other thing is yeah once it's been widened we can't undo it so uh if it's if the hatch window is too wide we have to be really careful about playing with co2 because if you've got a really wide hatch window and you start playing with co2 some of those birds are really going to need oxygen while you're doing that so you need to be careful and that concludes the presentation. So yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. But just before that, because I, as Keith was telling me, this goes on to YouTube. So what I would ask um, that if you enjoyed the presentation, that you like and share it. And the reason for that is because obviously these things cost money to do. And unless the companies are getting feedback that it works and that you guys are interested and want to see more of it, these things will stop. And so while we're in this COVID situation, while we, we're all kind of stuck at home, I think we should make the most of it and give the most amount of training we can. And with that, uh, Dr. Bramwell, I'll hand back to you. Great. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I always enjoy your presentations. Always very uh, thorough. Um, with what you talk about and um, explanation and then your graphics and everything are always really good. I always enjoy that. Um, yeah, we do have some some questions, um, some good questions what, that uh, you can expound upon. Um, one of the questions was with humidity and, and how what what role would humidity have an effect in the hatch window or would it not like humidity during incubation? Yeah, well, humidity will have a, a difference in terms of cooling capacity of the air. So if you've got very dry air, for example, you're not going to get as much cooling across those eggs. Um, but it's, it's one of those things that it's, you, you need to be a little bit careful with it. Um, at the beginning, we're going to have high humidity um, because we're not, we, we want to seal those machines up. But later on, we, we don't want it there. We, we still need to make our moisture loss. That's probably more important than... Uh, uh, yeah, later on, it's more important. At the beginning, temperature is most important, but later on, if we don't get that moisture loss, we we have a chick that doesn't perform. So humidity is important, but the, the ma majority of that, that driver, if you like, that's temperature. Everything is temperature. Yeah, okay. Um, 
the, you talked about the Spideys in there, and I know we've done we did a webinar on the Spideys and and discussing it and and uh, what it was and how to use it and, and everything. That's a that's a uh, process that Aviagen has has utilized and developed very well. Um, somebody asked about the Spideys. Can you briefly explain what Spideys is? We don't need to go into tremendous detail, but yeah, explain yeah. to what it is for people that are there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Spideys is as simple as warming the egg, eggs up and then cooling them back down. And it's, it's actually copying what the mother hen does every day. So right. whereas uh, the mother hen will lay an egg, she won't incubate that egg. Um, and we're talking about chickens. Some other breeds will do that, but um, or other species will. But when she goes and lays an, the egg the next day, she'll sit on that, that previous egg. So that will give a little period of incubation, a little short burst of incubation. So it's a short one. So they get a little short um, burst of energy, if you like, and that keeps the cells up and it keeps the, the embryos healthy. What we do with spideys is we allow four or five days and then we give a treatment. So when I talked about the, the cells, the cellular mortality as they die off, that allows the embryos to replace those dead cells. That's what spideys does. And because it replaces those dead cells, we don't need to add incubation time on like we would typically because of old age. So it stands for typically the title of it, short periods of incubation during egg storage pretty much explains what it is. And just, just to add on that, because I, I get these questions a lot as well of, you know, what if somebody, well, our egg age is normally five or six days or seven or eight, do I need to do a spidey's treatment? And I mean, and typically we say, no, I don't know what your comments are if it's a short-term egg storage. There's, there's a benefit to it, but it's, you have to weigh up whether it's commercially viable to do so. Um, you know, it, it's also a logistical thing. If you've only got four or five days, personally, I probably wouldn't do it unless you're talking about um, parent stock or up. And then I would be, yeah, I would do it because there is a, a big benefit in chick quality as well. Yeah. But yeah. with broilers, you, you shouldn't need to do it. And I've been, uh, I'm not very keen on, on long air gauge on broilers anyway, because normally you don't have the capacity to catch up. So if you've got two weeks worth of eggs, but you you don't have the capacity and you, you're much better off dumping eggs in the past i used to uh, lose eggs shall we say just right. to keep my eggs stocked hey. down otherwise it becomes a, a real hassle well and it affects and, and you know we've shown some research it affects the performance of the bird so if you yes. if you're gonna looks like you're gonna have a month or two or three of these old egg age and you want to start storing them like that just to get the most out of them you're going to affect your performance week after week yep. after week to get that egg so you're yep. right sometimes you're, just get rid of eggs you're better off taking in. the hit hard and fast and get it done uh, rather yeah. than just that little drip and that that's a horrible yeah. thing to be yeah yeah um so how would that affect when you're using the spideys or, or not how would how does that affect your hatch window it shortens it because the because those eggs that the long stored eggs for example they don't need as long to incubate so we don't have that, that doesn't drag across so much. So that Spidey's is really good for hatch window. Really works well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so kind of along with that in, in, in an egg storage type of capacity type of thing, what are your thoughts on um, pre-warming eggs? Um, you know, you talk about the, the, the condensation you want to be concerned about, but also what would be your recommendation if somebody wants to pre-warm? How would they do it? What are some things they might avoid in, in well, reference the, to the hatch window stuff? Yeah, in terms of hatch window, you what you want to do is make sure that you've got some airflow in there. That's why I kept coming back to this, this um, Newton's law of heating and cooling, because if you're trying to pre-warm in still air, you get that variation. So move the air through the eggs and... Uh, make sure we don't get that condensation because you will get evaporative cooling. So while you're trying to warm it up, you're cooling it down. That really doesn't, yeah. you know, it, it can be a, a real pain. Um, so there's, yeah, you need to make sure you don't get the condensation that the eggs warm up uniformly. We don't want those over here getting warmer than these because those eggs, if there's a, a couple of degree drift 
for example, and I've seen it uh, in hatcheries where you've got egg stores, where you've got different temperatures in different areas. And that, that egg temperature difference stays with those eggs for quite a number of hours afterwards. So it, you know, try and make sure you've got some good airflow, get them up. As soon as you get them to 24, 25, then you can start loading them into the, the incubator. You're good to go. And I think the key to what you said is a uniform pre-warming because I I've seen people says oh we need to pre-warm and they just stick them in a hallway, buggy to buggy yeah. back to back, yeah. and just they don't, have, the they don't have good air movement. Yeah. And I'll tell you what that'll hurt your hatch window. It, it, yeah. The longer they're there, the worse it hurts it unless you've got good air movement through there. So that's the key I yeah. think what you said. Air movement. Uh, and that's um, why I like to bounce the, the air off of the wall as well, not directly on the eggs. Because if you push it directly on the eggs, you're going to cool them as well. So trying to right. get a, a gentle airflow through them is, is much better. Yeah. Um, another question here, and, and this is, this is um, something that uh, we're seeing here, particularly in North America, um, really some challenges with fertility more than we've seen in, in decades. And this is, just, this is just across the industry. It's not even you know, one breed specific, it's across the industry. As far as your incubation, what recommendations or suggestions would you have on how to deal with that? What well, when um, you've the, got the fertility, very the fertility, low fertility? I mean, it's poor. Yeah, it's poor. It's the fertility has been down pretty much across North America for for some time, or some we've seen in decades. I mean, what, what from an incubation standpoint, not from an incubation standpoint, what are some things that we need to look at? Yeah, well, that? from an incubation point of view, I mean, it depends how low you're going, of course. Um, now, I'm not. I, I'm very happy to remove those eggs uh, at transfer, of course, but I'm not a big fan of backfilling. And unless you've got a complete disaster, you know, where you, you need the heat. The reason I don't like backfilling as a standard is because what you end up with is a lot of full trolleys, full trays, and then you'll end up with a space that's completely empty. And that empty space really messes up with your airflow. So you're much better off having empty, unless you can save running a machine, a whole machine, then it's worthwhile. But if you're going to um, backfill, then leave an empty area with no, no eggs in, in the hatcher, then that's, that's, it's just not worth doing. You might as well spread it across the whole, the whole hatcher. And, and, and if we've got, you know, if we've got known fertility issues, you know, might have to just your set temperature. Again, like you said, measuring shell, getting that shell temperature right, because that's- Egg shell fear. temperature will, will fix it all, to be honest. Yeah, and, once, and once you feedback. know that. Yeah. yeah that's, and if you've got, uh, yeah, especially if you've got, um, like you're measuring egg temperature in some of your machines, right? Then in that case, you need to go in and make sure they're fertile eggs, of course. If you, yeah. if you know you've got a fertility issue, we don't want to be measuring uh, on infertile eggs because it's going to be, uh, it's not going to end well. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it probably, I, I think in lights of both multi-stage and single stage, and we've had these discussions with a lot of customers, so what, what effects would a wide range of parental age in the same incubator have on that hatch window? Can you probably make a brief comment for multi-stage and single stage of what, what effect it's going to have, in your opinion? Yeah, well, I mean, what you've, you've got in multi-stage, in, in always in multi-stage, you've got this huge amount of variance of heat production. So you've got eggs there that are, of course, during different stages of incubation, but also from different flock ages with different fertilities. So trying to get the right temperature for those eggs for that batch of eggs is impossible, pretty much. I mean, it, you're going to get, a, like I say, it's an average of an average. You'll, you'll, okay. you'll do something that you'll, you'll get a result from, but it's never going to be optimal. With single stage, if you've got, uh, even if you've got a uh, single stage, but you've got a wide, you've got very young flocks or very old flocks in the same machine, then you're going to struggle. Then you need to use the, uh, you know, all incubators will have areas that are warmer than and some that are cooler. Then you need to use those to your benefit of the eggs that you put in. So you can load the machine in a way that optimizes that. 
and and that's depending on what machine you use, of course. Yeah, and and I think the larger machines and the smaller operations are going to have more of a challenge. You know, we're 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 trying to load our machines, and and the eggs are the input we put in there. And if we don't really control that input, our machines have to do the best they can. And if we've got a wide range of fertility, everything, then yeah. That, that's a huge problem now with, I mean, people just look at the price of a, an incubator and they say, oh, per egg space, this is much cheaper. So they end up buying the biggest machine they can buy yep. and then part loading it. And, and it's, it's just, a, it's a false economy. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it, just looking at the small picture. Yeah, makes it tough. We do what we have to do, but it does make it tough. Uh, yeah. do, do you have a comment on um, day of transfer and, and the potential effect on hatch windows? Say somebody is transferring in 18 days or 19 days. Do you see that as having an effect on that hatch window? Uh, it shouldn't do. The difference between 18 and 19 days shouldn't make much difference. If you're going to uh, transfer earlier than that, uh, earlier than 18 days, assuming you're not vaccinating in OVO, of course, but then you need to change your parameters for your hatcher so that they would emulate a setter. Uh, I, I've had in the past where people have had to transfer at 14 days. And actually, it's not such a problem so long as you adjust the parameters inside your hatcher. It, everything is doable, but you, if you try and run it like a hatcher, then you're going to have problems. Yeah. What about when you're bringing eggs in from the farm? Um, you know, is there a problem if you dramatically reduce temperature? Like their example is, say you're coming from 30 degrees Celsius and you're wanting to just immediately drop them down to 12 degrees Celsius in the egg storage. You, is, there, is there an issue you see with that if you do that quick drop? I, 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 would, I would be very hesitant to, to do that. Uh, I would ask why, why, why are they <laughs> transporting at 30 degrees? Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, that, I would say fix that problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's probably good. At the, the other thing too is that I that I would just comment add on to that is that if you, if, if whatever reason you've got to do that, you just like you've said before, you better have very good air movement through that facility because in reality that that embryo itself doesn't drop that temperature right away. It takes a while for the shell and the albumin and the oak content, yeah. so it's a slow change anyways for that embryo. But I think what you said earlier, the big thing is make sure it's uniform and you've got air movement through there. Because if you bring them in at 30 Celsius and pack them in an egg room at 12 and you don't have good air movement, it's going to be a disaster. Yeah, you'll see huge variation through that that room right. if you do that. Yeah, yeah, real bad. Um, do you see any any um, differences between like, uh, like for grandparents stock, male line, female? line as far as hatch window uh, one of our viewers i think deals with that they have both and wondering if there's a normal difference you would see yeah uh, in the past i with the, my current role i don't really see that uh, but i can tell you that different lines will hatch in a different way some will right be right at the last minute and pop up like popcorn you know they they all come together others do tend to, to drag now some of that will be the environment of the farms for sure but i've seen it where you've got different farms but the reaction is the same so there is something in in that um that those lines that seem to to predetermine how they're going to behave yeah so there, yeah, there yeah. is an element to it for sure yeah and i've seen that more in different different species like even commercial quail lines to where they've been separate for so long and the way they've been incubated and handled and transferred that even their incubation times are dramatically different. And that's just mm -hmm. because how they've managed them. And then genetically generation after generation, you get some, so I would, I would suspect that different lines are going to have a little bit different tendencies mm -hmm. or something. Okay. If somebody has to transfer eggs um, from a single stage, don't know why they'd do this at day 16. Would you expect that to hatch, affect the hatch window much? day 16 transfer uh, well so long as if you do it at day 16 like uh one of my old friends had to do that where he did it even earlier like i say so long as you're going to change the parameters of your hatcher to run like a setter so don't put the humidity on uh, if you're single stage for example 
because you're that period you're still trying to get your moisture loss out um so so long as you change the parameters i wouldn't expect you to see big difference on your hatch window but uh, you know at, at day 18 go back in there and change the parameters back to run like a hatchet yeah yeah you can make the machine yeah you can make <laughs> machines you run like you want but yeah that's true okay one one final question uh, and then again, this is you can answer it in generalities because this is probably a little bit machine specific, but I think the, the concept would be the same. Um, they're, they're wanting to use it in OVO vaccination, but they have multi stage equipment and they said their embryonic age is, is a disaster. It's like, it's a, what can they do to get a very close range in the, in the embryo uh, development to use a OVO? And, and again, you know, not getting machine specific, but in generalities, I mean, what's what do they need to do? Well, and that's what you need to do is, is work out what is your eggshell temperatures throughout those machines. I mean, the first thing, start from the beginning. So make sure if, if you can have auto nests, make sure that those eggs are cooling down at the same rate because all that stuff just makes it worse. Right. Um, in terms of your incubator, Go around, check those eggshell temperatures around the machine because you might find that there you can sort of, especially where you you place uh, certain eggs into certain areas. That there's you can optimize a little bit, but if you're doing an ovo vaccination, it's that's a tough one because you're you're going to struggle to get uh, you're going to struggle to get that same biological age. Um, the, the one thing I would say is with the multi stages is, is a, you've got to figure out what's wrong in the multi, <laughs> you know, if you've got a big embryo age, like you said, go like exactly what you said, go back to the very beginning. But also my, my experience is you've got some poor ventilation in your multi stage. I, I mean, I, and I've seen that before where you've got from top to bottom to middle, whatever, very big differences in eggshell temperature, like you said. So measuring that, monitoring that, figuring out what's going on there, because that's what that's what's going on. Is you've yeah. got some different temperature, hot and cool spots in your machine that's causing uh, affecting growth. I think there is a problem with the multi stage as well. Is, is trying to make sure the maintenance is done because they are right. running twenty four seven. That they do tend to drift, and it's a little drift at a time. So by the time you get to realize what's going on, it you're already sort of six. 12 months down the road. Right. So uh, it's, it's one of those things where, especially with maintenance, it's really important on multi-stage. And those yeah. eggshell temps, it's the same. But those, those embryos, the chicks always tell you what's going on inside the incubators. They're, they're absolutely telling you what's happening. Yeah. Um, one final question from our Spanish listeners. So we'll have um, Catalina Diaz uh, pop in real quick and she can interpret that for you and and just give your answer in English and then the Spanish will get their translation. Sure. So Carolina, you want to come in and ask this last question here? Um, hello, Jason, how are you? Hi, I'm good. Um, we have one question in Spanish from Arturo Flores. And he's saying if the temperature is, let's say at 10 in the morning at 99.5, and then it is increasing, like consequently, um, can it affect the uniformity of the hatch? Can, can you repeat the question? I'm not sure I understood it. Sure. So he says, if the temperature is unstable, and let's say no. at 10 in the morning, the air temperature? at 99.5, and, and 3 p.m., it's at 100 Fahrenheit, and then at eight at night. Um, so you're talking in the in the breeder house, the hen house. Basically, I think what you speak is a little bit in the hen like, house. You know, let's say 104. Can these affect the uniformity of the hats? So you're talking about in in the house itself. I think he's referring more for the warm up process. 99.5 and 100 degrees. And that's, that sounds like eggshell temperature to me. Or, or air temperature in a house is what I'm thinking is in a, there are transportation. I don't know. 
I, I mean, I, I would I would summarize yeah, it, Jason. Okay, so I'll just clarifying what kind of temperature is it if it's an an actual list. I, I would yeah, just summarize it. If you've got varying temperatures, how does that affect Hatch window? That's why I would summarize it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, if you've got that, I mean, if that's uh, 99.5 to 100, uh, yeah, I mean, if that's, it depends where you're looking, to be honest. I mean, if, if it's in a setter, for example, it's still quite a big drift, but you will get that temperature change, you know, with, depending on the angle of the, uh, so if you're turning, for example, expect to see a difference in temperature there. Uh, that's quite normal. So I, I wouldn't be too worried, but that's half a degree. Okay. I mean, if it depends again, are you looking at the same egg or is it a different egg? Is it a different, you know, it could be a different size. There's too many variables. Well, I, I would, my concern would be, and just to wrap up with this is that if it's consistently in the morning lower and in the evening lower, then there's something going on in the hatchery that you've got that much change in temperature right. the other thing is, yeah. is that like you said if they're checking at the exact same time in the morning and the turn angle is one way and then and they check at the exact same time later and the turn angle is also the all always the other way you will see a difference in, yes. in that temperature yeah. but but that's just that's why one reason why we turn yeah. anyway I, I did have um, a yeah i did have a hatchery a long time back there in in south africa where they hadn't insulated the roof space and for sure that every it was every day from about 12 to 2 it always get overheating in the, the back corners of the machines because the temperature above the machine was getting it was going higher than the incubator itself and that was starting to, to really mess up the the machine yeah, but so those that, things you need, yeah you need to make sure that the air coming in is 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 that changing is yeah. right right um, well, thank you, Jason, very much. I, I always enjoy listening you. to you, uh, your, your speak and your presentations. You always have a lot of thought and depth in that. Um, and uh, so if we didn't get to your question, we'll, we'll try and get to it later after the fact, or you can contact Jason Cormick directly with Avigen um, for some assistance on that wealth of knowledge. Again, thank you very much. It was a pleasure having you, having you here. Um, with us. So I'm uh, Dr. Bramwell with Jason, James Lloyd Chickmaster Incubator Company and Jason Cormick. Thank you. And we'll look forward to seeing you uh, again at another webinar series. So thank you all. all right. for Good to see you again. All right. Take Bye. care. Thank you, Jason. Bye -bye.